Hey, and welcome back to Terry Talks Movies. Uh, about a year ago, I picked up this. The Umbrella Entertainment Blu-ray of the 1976 version of King Kong. It's a good bare-bones kind of release with a couple of extras, mostly a 22-minute making-of documentary and 14 minutes of deleted scenes. But for those of us who are completists in this sort of thing, I was never enormously impressed with the 1976 King Kong so Umbrella sent this one out to me and I, I went to re-watch it because I'd watched it in VHS days. And I went in with really low expectations and it surprised me how good it was and how much fun it was. Maybe I'd need to do that in 23. You can watch all movies with low expectations. If they come out being total crap, that's fine. I've lost too much of my joie de vivre. If they, if they are better than I expect them to be, of course, then my expectations are enormously exceeded and I'm a happy chappy. King Kong Lives starts with a recap of the previous movie. You've got Jessica Lang and Jeff Bridges yelling at King Kong. The American army in attack helicopters plink him off the top of the tower and he falls 421 metres down to the concrete. In the real world, if that happened, he'd smash like a furry watermelon and they'd clean him up with pressure hoses and a bulldozer. But that doesn't happen. Kong dies pretty much intact. And then we cut to 10 years later, where he is on a respirator and a heart-lung machine in an institute in Georgia, run by a doctor called Amy, played by Linda Hamilton, two years after she did The Terminator. Now, all credit to Linda Hamilton. This movie is, is deeply silly and off the charts weird. But she commits to the character and commits to the role and does a really fantastic job of anchoring all that silliness. She's got a problem. She's got an artificial heart that she wants to implant into Kong's chest. And the artificial heart's about the size of a tuk-tuk. She doesn't have enough blood to do transfusions so that Kong can stay alive during the operation. Fortunately... A guy called Hank finds a female in the jungles of Borneo. Now, we don't get told whether it's Indonesian Borneo or the Kingdom of Brunei because American movies didn't care about that kind of thing. He's played by an actor called Brian Kerwin, who, along with Linda Hamilton, anchors this shit down so that we can believe the silliness and not feel like we're being ripped off. And it keeps us happy through all of the business with the guys in the big hairy suits. Now, De Laurentiis spent a decade trying to work out how to do a sequel. A couple of writers called Ronald Susan and Steve Pressfield came up with the idea of the heart transplant thing. De Laurentiis liked it. Wasn't too keen on the female Kong, but when the writers went to him, well, King Kong had to have a mother, so there must be females. He went along with it. So the female Kong is brought to Georgia and housed in an aircraft hangar about a mile away from where Kong is and they get some transfusion blood from her and do the transfusions which will look really funny because the tubes for the transfusions are like this big and um and the operation goes ahead the surgical instruments are crazy big there's an enormous circular saw they used to cut up in Kong's chest and there's lots of blood spurting up on Linda Helton and the other people doing the surgery and then they get this thing that looks like, I think a giant claw that looks like the claw in a crane game. And it yeets out the heart while the block and tackle lower the new one in. They hook up the plane, so Kong up, and he's good to go. Unfortunately, as he comes around, he smells the female from a mile away. Because that's the nature of the beast. And they escape. The army gets involved. There's a lieutenant major, played by John Ashton who was the most stereotyped and cringy military person in 1980s cinema. He's a cigar-chomping Captain Ahab. No nuance at all. Disobeys orders. He wants to kill King Kong, and he is going to break the rules to do it if he has to. So the army chases Kong through the countryside. Queen Kong gets captured again. King Kong falls off a cliff into a river, bashes his head against a rock, and everybody assumes that he's dead even though there's not an enormous corpse further downriver. What they don't realise is that Kong's downriver in a swamp, eating crocodiles to keep himself alive. Now, I'm not going to knock eating crocodiles. I've eaten crocodile myself. 
It tastes like chicken, but it's got a texture like pork. It's a nice meat. So Kong's basically grabbing it and eating these crocodiles. And it's only later on when he finds out where the female is that they get back together and everybody realizes he's alive. But Amy and Hank think he's alive, so they fly around the countryside in Hank's light plane, landing where they can, camping out, and then continue with the search while the army is also searching for the possibility that Kong's still around. And there's a great moment when they're camping, which plays really well to a modern audience because Hank and Amy are in the sleeping bag together, and Hank actively asks for consent. Are you sure about this? We're primates, too. Before they make love. And this plays really well to a modern audience. It's a moment that's ahead of its time in so many ways. And I like the way it's played. The actors play it really well. And it gives us a, a kind of subtlety and a groundedness that let me survive all of the silliness. Now, a movie like this requires willing suspension of disbelief, which is another way of saying Ignore the big hairy suits with the zippers down the back and just go with it. Now, the facial expressions we get for Kong and Queen Kong were by an Italian special effects artist called Carlo Rambaldi, who had worked with Fellini and Pasolini and Mario Bava before going to America and doing E.T. and Close Encounters. He also did some work on Alien. The ability to give subtle facial expressions just wasn't technically possible at the time. Rambaldi did okay, but he didn't have Arduinos and micro switches and things like that that modern physical effects technicians have. So he doesn't give us a particularly subtle monster. And also the proportions of human eyes in these face masks are just not right. It wasn't until Andy Serkis and Peter Jackson did King Kong at the end of the 20th century using computer special effects that they could change those proportions and get an ape that looks like an ape rather than a guy in a vaudeville suit. So there are those limitations to this one. It has a couple of nice moments in it. The death of the Lieutenant Colonel, which is no real spoiler because you know the guy's going to get killed right from the moment he starts chomping on a cigar in a jeep. It's funny. <laughs> it really is funny. And the movie has a dumb silliness about it which carries it through, um, yeah, it's enormously more enjoyable than the 1976 King Kong, and that surprised me. Now, Umbrella not only have put it out in a really nice package with a whole bunch of extras, including, he said, reading it off the box. An audio commentary by author Ray Morton, a new interview with a miniature effects supervisor, David M. Jones. A video essay by Stephen Vag about John Gilliman as a movie director. It was directed by John Gilliman, who directed the 1976 King Kong as well. And he had a really interesting history as a, a director in British cinema before he went to um, America in the 1960s and started working there. And he was also a man quite troubled by mental illness. So Stephen Vag's video essay gives a lot of previous John Gilliman movies that we might want to check out. And there's also the original theatrical teaser trailer and the stills gallery. It's a nice package. But not only that, you get more, you get steak knives. There you go. There are some posters that come along with this. On reasonable card, there's one of them, movie posters. There's a great Japanese one I like a lot. That works for me. There's one that's a bit of a spoiler for the ending, so I won't show that for too long. There's a very grim and dark one. There's a nice Japanese one. I like that poster a lot. And we get that version of it. But also, you get the posters. There's the standard one there. And I'll just hold it up as best I can. Which works quite well. And you get a larger version of the Japanese one that I like a lot. So I'm bringing put together a really nice package for this one. Um, Beyond Genre's series that they're doing is fantastic. It's giving us stuff that... It's kind of niche, but it is great. Things like Dagon have turned up on there. And um, I haven't got all of the Beyond Genres, because a lot of them I, I don't particularly enjoy. But they keep coming out with new stuff, and every second or third one of those is something that I really, really, really want. And so I, I bought a number of them, and 
I may well backfill where I can on some of the other Beyond Genres um, movies that Umbrella has put out. But given that you've stuck around this far into my video, I've got a giveaway. Two best comments. I'll get Middle Age Geek Girl to select the best comments on this one. Get some extras. The first one is another Beyond Genres, number 23. Sons of Steel. Now this one is not region locked. It's all region. Sons of Steel, the Australian science fiction musical movie from the 1980s. It's uh, also got a 48 page booklet and a CD soundtrack of the music. So that's one of the giveaways I'm doing. And thank you to Umbrella for giving me these movies. And the other one is the Australian crime drama. Again, this one is region unlocked. You can watch it anywhere. Money Movers. Really gritty little um, crime drama. It's got a comic book inside. I've also got a day bill poster for this one, which goes to the person who gets this. Now, I'll randomly select which of the two winners gets which one, and I'll contact those people and get them to send me their address. I've done a previous giveaway, and I'm, I'm going to send those ones out this week as well. But thanks again to Umbrella for giving me the King Kong Lives and showing me something I didn't know I was going to enjoy. And also for delivering the giveaways that we've got. I've got a couple of other things I can give away. But I'm going to save those for a little bit later. So anyway, that's it for this time around. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please like, subscribe and leave a comment. Let me know whether you enjoyed King Kong Lives. And whether it was a bit of fun for you or whether you didn't. Because it might be worth a revisit if you didn't. You can also support the channel by donating at patreon.com slash paleo cinema got some uh recent hidden gem science fiction movies i'm going to talk about next time around and i've also got a live stream coming up early february so i'm not sure what i'm going to do for that but it's going to be a lot of fun because the live streams always are fun so in the meantime look after yourselves watch some good movies watch some bad movies watch some 1980s sequels that are better than you expect them to be and i'll catch you next time